Whereas Food Allergy Awareness Week was established as a national week of encouraging food allergy awareness and supporting those who are impacted by food allergies and anaphylactis, and whereas food allergies affect as many as 32 million Americans, including 6 million children, and whereas the prevalence of food allergies appears to be increasing among children under the age of 18, which is two students in every classroom. And whereas according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, between 1997 and 2011, the prevalence of food allergies rose 50%. And whereas eight foods account for 90% of all food allergy reactions, peanuts, tree nuts, milk, egg, wheat, soy, fish, and shellfish, and whereas a food allergy is an immune system response to the body, correction, immune system response to a food the body mistakenly believes is harmful. When a person with food allergy eats the food, his or her immune system releases massive amounts of chemicals, including histamine, that trigger a cascade of symptoms that can affect the respiratory system, the gastrointestinal tract, the skin, and or the cardiovascular system. And whereas there is no cu cure for food allergies, strict avoidance is the only way to prevent an allergic reaction. And whereas anaphylaxis is a serious allergic reaction that comes on quickly and has the potential to become life-threatening, and whereas managing a food allergy on a daily basis involves constant vigilance and trace amounts of an allergy can trigger an allergic reaction in some individuals, and whereas Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Connection Team, FACT, is a national nonprofit organization committed to their mission to educate, advocate, and raise awareness for all individuals and families affected by food allergies and life-threatening anaphylaxis, and therefore be it resolved that I, Keith, Mayor Keith Hedrick, do hereby proclaim May 9th through 15th, 2021, as Food Allergy Awareness Week in the city of Groton and encourage all residents to increase their understanding and awareness of this potentially life-threatening medical condition. Given under this hand, given under my hand, this 26th day of April, 2021, signed Keith Hedrick, Mayor, City of Groton. So once again, Graham, I wanna thank you and your family for being on tonight and for bringing this to our attention and for keeping us involved. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Council, any questions from the council? Comments? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. We will move to the second thing. Like I said, today is our last meeting of this council. And for one member in this uh, room, it is her last meeting after 22 years of faithful and loyal service to the city of Groton, and that is Deb Patrick, our city clerk. So I want to say, Deb, thank you very much. We have a, we have a uh, plaque here, city clerk Deb Patrick, for grateful appreciation for your 22 years of service to the city of Groton from 1999 to 2021. So there have been so many things that you've been involved in and so many things that you have helped mayors over the years and that you have helped me with in the last four years. I appreciate everything that you've done and I wish you as Navy terms, fair winds and falling seas when you retire. So thank you so much for what you do. Okay, I will, I will turn it over to the council. Council, the floor is open. Deputy Mayor Depot, you want to go? Sure. Deputy Mayor Depot. Um, I just want to say I know um, the city clerk job is a lot of remembering all the rules and um, like that. I'm a big rule person, so I appreciate always being able to defer to Deb and ask questions. And um, you know, in the middle of meetings where we have a question about the procedure, you're always there, and I really appreciate it. So um, you know, thank you so much for all your hard work I don't think people realize long days and then you come to night meetings it's, it's a lot of hours that you put in being the clerk so um, I appreciate it thank you anyone else from the council uh, Councilor Carter so <laughs> you're, yeah in my opinion you're, you're not replaceable you know um, I think we're, we're gonna find that out but you know the next person's gonna learn and hopefully can fill your shoes um, 
in the in the right manner you know uh, maybe not to your capability but maybe someday you know um with with your position it's it, it's unique because you have been an employee but you've been an, an, an elected official for that much time you know um other than the mayor you know there's no other position that's elected in a paid position correct in the city that is correct and to do it that long is just you know that just speaks volumes to what she brought to the city um so i uh i thank you and i wish you the best um and whatever you choose to do um after this i know being a grandma is one of them so <laughs> but thank you councillor mccabe deb i've only uh worked with you for the past two years but uh Unlike Glenn, I'm not as much of a rural follower, so I appreciated that you were able to guide me so that I didn't misstep. So uh, I also wish you the very best on your next life journey, and um, we'll miss you. Councilor Sheffield. Deb, I'm not sure what we're going to do without you, actually. <laughs> oh, you think so? I'm, I don't know. Um, <laughs> we'll make you, we'll make you sign up for a citizens petition. There you go. <laughs> Deb, but again, thank you for your service to the city. You've been great. Um, the city will miss you, and uh, uh, your your dedication, the, the picnics, uh, all the all the work you've done. Um, uh, I'll always, you know. Respect, respect that, and um, you know. Hopefully, uh, others that follow you will will carry that torch uh, as you have. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Norris. Not quite sure how long I've known you, but it feels like 20 years. When I was over in the town of Groton, but I just want to say more than anything else, you're an awesome person. So thank you. Okay, so with that, we're going to take a five minute recess so that we can get pictures and cake. So <laughs> we, are doing, we are doing a five minute recess, right? Okay, we're doing a five minute recess for pictures and cake. Okay, we are in recess. Yeah, we should probably go to the foyer. Council, if you can join me in the foyer, and anyone else?
on. Uh, Mary, if you could present your budget. Okay. Uh, good, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, as you, uh, most of you know, my budget's in two parts. Uh, we have the first part, which is recreation, which is all our um, operations of all our programs, the beach, um, and any of those things that come under that part of recreation. Uh, this is budget's up by 4.77%. A lot of that is uh, due to the farmer's market. Uh, last year, if you all recall, we added the farmer's market, took it over. Um, it had been run independently in the city for four years by other agencies, and we thought it would be in the best interest of the city to take it over um, under the Parks and Recreation Department, of which we did last year. Kind of not, kind of just, I won't say we didn't know what we were doing, but we didn't know what our dollar amounts would be because we've never done it before. So we only budgeted actually for a market master or a market manager. So my budget this year presents a market, the, the individual to do the, um, to run the farmer's market and all the necessary line items that go with it. So, um, uh, contractual services, in the past the farmer's markets used to have uh, music and different things that um, used to come and entertain the, the patrons. Hopefully we can get back to that part of this, that, this year. And it also um, in, encompasses uh, supplies, which we didn't have. <coughs> Uh, we've bought banners, we've bought flags, we've bought different things for the existing market, but eventually those things will need to be replaced. So we've pulled, the, the, the farmer's market was actually under the playground budget, so we've pulled that out and made it a standalone account so that we have a, a strong understanding and knowledge of how much it's actually costing us to run the farmer's market from the, through the city, and then it will also have a revenue source. Um, vendors tra get charged $150 for the season to be here. Um, we also extended our farmer's market this year, and, and we budgeted accordingly for that for the winter ones that we did not anticipate having last year. So there's a, a big increase with that. Well, not big, $7,800. And the other increase is under the, um, the beach operations in regards to having staff there till 8 o'clock, which involves having supervisors there for an additional 14 hours a week. So there's a $3,200 increase in, in the beach operations uh, for the um, operations of the beach. Now, did the some of the increase also come from the step up of the wages as well? Correct. Yes, there was an increase in some in some of our um, one of my employee, employees that comes under this. My administrative assistant had contractual. Um, some of the, the contract was ratified, so her increases were we caught up, and then there was an increase in my salary through the course of the year in January that now is reflected in the in the budget but there's also i may be wrong on this but the the state's going up to 15 dollars an hour for minimum wage so there's a couple steps during this year that's can you walk just it, well, real quickly it, it, walk yes us there is that? so there is increases with minimum wage this year it kind of changes <clears throat> halfway through the season uh with the playground budget it actually because we took the farmer's market out of there my playground budget is actually lower than it was last year because i took the ten thousand dollars out um, the beach, some of the increase in that, um, there's only two, two positions at the beach and they um, didn't offset it too much, but we are in that process. They kids start, or I shouldn't say kids, the young adults and some of our adults start at $12 an hour when they start in June and then you go to 13 in August. So we've budgeted accordingly to make, make sure we get that. And then that way we're ahead up to that $14 that next June. Right. So, sorry, I didn't. So, no, that's okay, <laughs> but I wanted to make sure that the council understood that for the next couple of years, there will be some increases in our <clears throat> entry level positions because we're working our way up to the $15 an hour minimum wage. Correct. So that's good. I'm sorry, Mary. No, so that's, that's where the increases uh, for the recreation side of things are. Okay, questions from the council? Deputy Mayor Depot. Um, not really a question, just a comment. Um, mm -hmm. I know that I've had a ton of feedback on the farmer's market that everyone loves it. I think it's well worth the, I mean, it's 
this is a pretty minor increase to include and improve the farmer's market. And I think, you know, even knowing we didn't know exactly what we were doing last year, we are kind of getting yes. our groove a little bit. Um, and I'm sure with this year, because of COVID, I think that we're probably going to have even more people want to participate in the farmer's market and in beach stuff. So um, I think it's important to make sure that our services are um, at a proper level. And I think a lot of people have been wanting lifeguards at the beach till 8 p.m. So I think it's worth the investment to have that stuff available. I think our um, this is one department I hear a lot of feedback and residents appreciate all the services that we offer. So thank you. Other councilors? Councilor Sheffield. Uh, Mary, I see a slight increase in office supplies and advertising. Is there going to be additional? Um, Again, that kind of reflects towards the farmer's market. Farmers, okay. It's just, it's easier to put that all in one spot. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Mary and I had a discussion about what to do with the farmer's market. If you remember, if you go back, we were down to four vendors and, and it was withering away. And uh, we had a discussion and, and I <clears throat> made a comment in public about that I thought that we could do a good job and that resulted in a phone call uh, to Mary uh, that they said, well, you know, we need to talk about this. So we got together and we, we worked with the, the group and we've taken it over. And Mary has a market master, Megan Aikman. I think many of you have met her and she has done tremendous job, a tremendous job with everything that she could do during the, with all the COVID restrictions. And she expanded it to, I think we had approximately 11 vendors at the end. And then we did something this year that has not been done before. And that is we expanded it indoors into the auditorium. And that was a, a tremendous success. So uh, this is something that I will wholeheartedly get behind because the city of Groton is a food desert. It is important that we bring fresh foods and vegetables to people here. And uh, we do this in conjunction with our mobile food pantries and drives and things like that. So any other questions or comments from Mary on this portion? Councilor Norris. Um, well done on seeing a need and an opportunity and continuing with the farmer's market. That was excellent. Can you please tell me in your budget at the beach, do you do maintenance or any type of operational clearing, that kind of stuff during the non-summer months? If you could tell me what happens there with your maintenance crew, pretty much from like September to April. You want me to cover that in the recreation side and not the maintenance side? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, I can, if you Counselor want. Norris, we'll, <laughs> we, the next part of the budget, because this is the first time you've seen the budget, yeah. we'll go under the maintenance side and she'll cover maintenance for the entire group, if that's okay. No, absolutely. I stand corrected and I'll come back. Okay. No, we're good. Anything else on the recreation side? Okay. And oh. we, we have expanded some programming here on parks and rec and uh we will continue to do so in order to keep the uh children's activities particularly involved and there's some things that that mary's looking at from the adult side as well but definitely for the children's recreation programs we will continue that mary please just another uh, thought to that um we have kept obviously we lost some of our programs this year because of covid we also have had struggles because we don't have a school currently here. We used to do a lot of things at West Side and we had to um, walk away from that site because it became a construction zone. We did have a contingency plan in place last year to use the Marine Science School for our, that side, of, you know, the West Side site of playground, but we only got six kids because of COVID. So we didn't use that site, but eventually hopefully we have a new school with new facilities that we can really engage and do a, a lot of good things for the, for the youth and, and the adults of our community. So that, that so that's maintained in this budget, even moving forward. Councilor Norris, you had a comment. Were you able to serve the same number of kids as in previous summers? We were prepared to. Um, we didn't get that many registered. We only had 84 kids in our summer playground program last year. Uh, a lot, I think, was the unknown of COVID. They were out of school for the spring part of the year, and I, I believe parents were a little leery. Um, our numbers increased as the summer went. 
um, but we're we're normally at 285 kids, so we lost a, a, an average about 200 kids last year. But the calls are coming in already for this year, so we're excited. Anything else on the parks and recreation side? Okay, seeing none. Mary will move on to maintenance. All right. So the maintenance side of our budget is up about six point six point six one percent. Um, this uh, budget has the staff staffing in it for the maintenance of all of our facilities. Um, there was uh, a contract settled with them also, so there's a, roughly a $29,000 increase just in salaries um, for those three, plus the overtime, it, we kind of caught everything up because you know, we have a, um, this time of year, they're here every weekend until like at least October, which is our, so there's an overtime increase. Uh, this, bud this side of the budget also houses my capital improvement, which is up uh, $25,000 this year from last year. And it also covers all of my um, uh, pension, health insurance, workman's comp, all of those um, numbers that I get from the finance director um, are in this side of the budget for maintenance. Um, to answer Councillor Norris's previous question, uh, we do maintain facilities year round. Uh, the beach is open, t it is open 12, days a 12 months a year. Uh, we don't close it, we just stop supervising it. So we still, like, we're mowing grass down there now. Come the 1st of June, we'll start grooming the, gr the sand, so the sand and the beach are in, in the night, nice, a better condition with no seaweed and stuff once we open for the season. And we do that every week during the season, and we'll do it two weeks into the September part of the year, because uh, re residents still use the beach even once we stop charging it. Labor Day, um, and they're mowing the grass through October. We're emptying trash cans. We have the we have the Zabersky House, which is a year-round facility that we keep. You know, there's power, there's fuel, there's heat. So those um, are all taken care of out of this budget. <clears throat> Questions for Mary regarding the maintenance section, Deputy Mayor Depot. Um, I see in the capital projects mm -hmm. we have the press box listed there. Does that have a date? of expected like starting or well because i know we've had trouble yes getting that this is to started. help because we we have money already budgeted a couple years back in capital for the press boxes uh, was for two um we took it out to bid and they came in almost 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 triple what we anticipated a lot was due to we were in covid and construction costs were going through the roof so we we Added, a, uh, added some money this year so we could add to what we have and, and try to get at least one. On field one doesn't have one anymore. We had to knock it down because it was a, a safety issue. So hopefully with this added funding, we can move forward and get that completed. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Any other questions? Okay, then that's it. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Turn this off you we will now have building and zoning, and that's Joe Summers. Starts on page 34. It's all yours. Okay. Uh, you know, good evening, everybody. I'm Joe Summers, the building and zoning official. I've uh, been here with the city for about five months uh, with a lot of little changes. And with this year's budget, I took a look at a lot of the numbers. And overall, uh, looking at reducing our budget by 9.91%. A good part of that is due to contractual services, uh, which is related to the electric boat south yard expansion. Uh, there's been money set aside to pay for uh, an inspector we have on a contractual basis to do the inspections there and also to assist with plan reviews for that uh, expansion. It's, it's anticipated at after the uh, fiscal year 2023 that number will drop down to around 15,000. Right now, next year we're looking at budgeting 885,000 for that uh, just in case we need to bring an additional person or go out for more plan review services. The other line item that we have um, a reduction in is office supplies and advertising. Uh, 
within our budget, uh, there were two copier leases. We only have one copier, so that was a reduction of 4,200. And some of the other upgrades that have been done uh, with the computers, uh, those have been completed, so some numbers came out of that. Uh, one item that we do anticipate for next year is the adoption of a new state building code. So office supplies and advertising includes monies to purchase uh, code books and reference materials as that progresses further. It's anticipated sometime next year, just don't know the exact date yet because the state's in the process of uh, reviewing the amendments and developing the schedule. And the last item that uh, reducing is on the vehicle operations and supplies. Since we have two uh, 2020 new vehicles, uh, the cost of maintenance and fuel costs should go down. Uh, but I do have some monies left in there in case we have to have an issue with the tire or something like that. So uh, I didn't want to reduce it too much on that. Uh, and the other line items stayed the same because they could fluctuate, uh, especially with the boards and commissions. Kept those numbers the same because we don't know what is coming in or what other issues we may have. Any questions? Deputy Mayor Depot. Uh, less of a <clears throat> excuse me, less of a question, but um, I just want to say thank you very much. Um, it must be a little difficult to come into a new job and almost right away have to start working on the budget. It's not the most fun part of the job, I would imagine. Um, and I just want to point out the, the reductions that you found in the budget are helping us keep the taxes level, mm -hmm. even when other departments have increases. So I think, you know, that should be commended. It's, um, it certainly makes all of our lives easier mm -hmm. to not have to increase taxes. Um, so I just want to say thank you. And um, I'm excited to see what else you do with fresh eyes in that department so um yeah. that's it yeah we have a lot of things in the work uh, the mayor has been helpful and ron so everybody's been very helpful and a lot of it goes <clears throat> goes back to streamlining the permitting process we started that back in 17. we are continuing that uh we the council just authorized uh the permitting software. Uh, yeah uh, yeah, and we're shooting for to, July to buy the put, right. So we're going to be doing that. That helps. One thing <clears throat> to notice here on the financing plan: permits are down to a million dollars. And one of the things that uh, Deputy Mayor Depot talked about is the ability for us to maintain taxes low. Now, one of the things that uh, Ron Uhas and I are looking at with Joe's help is the projection of what is our what will our permit fees look like, mm -hmm. and then when do you get certificates of occupancy and when does that hit the rolls because when you're talking about the the buildings in electric boat they are in an enterprise account enterprise zone and so therefore <clears throat> they don't come straight on to once they get to CO they don't come straight on to the grand list they are staggered they're stepped in 20 percent there's five-year payback to get to hundred percent so it's 20% step. So what's going to happen is permit fees are going to come down and you're starting to step up from the COs. And we've, we've looked out, and if you notice in this year's budget, we talked about having a 24.1% uh, uh, general fund so that it's high. Our lenders want us to be between 20 and 24, or excuse me, 20 and 25. So what that does, keeping that high and with the reserves that we have, We'll, we will be able to use some of that for next year and that will help offset so that when the fees start to come down and you have that first couple increments, then that'll help offset the potential where we may have to raise taxes. And that's what we're looking at. And that's how we're managing. We're looking out uh, several years down the road, three and five years down the road. We're looking at expenses and at potential revenues. So anything else for uh, Joe Summers. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Joe. The next one will be non-departmentals, 93. Uh, <clears throat> this is Ron. This is basically... I'll let Ron... So 
as the mayor pointed out, we'll start on page 93. What these are, these are the catch-alls, um, items that are not in any specific budget. They're just, that's why they're called the non-departmentals. The first um, one is the general insurance, which again is page 93. That will stay at um, the same budget as last year, 115000 What this does is there's some miscellaneous insurance costs that get um, charged to this account that aren't department specific and as well as a portion of our consultant, insurance consultant, which is USI, which you guys had Chris come out a few, few months back. So no change there. The next page um, or next section that we'll go to is 96, which is the pay adjustment line. What this is is a placeholder for any open contracts and the such or any pay increases that aren't inside any individual budget. This allows them to be outside and reallocated back into departments if there's a contract that's settled during the year. So that way, the, that, then they didn't budget for the any proposed increases. So it's more just a placeholder. You see it's down the same again as last year at the 25 because most contracts were settled going into this year. There will be potentially, potentially some that may not be bought. The plan is that everything will be settled and this won't need to be used. So that's the pay adjustment. The next section, uh, page 99, is the debt service. This is our bond payments. So this is based just like your mortgage, based on an amortization schedule that is um, provided to us. So you'll see there, there's a decrease in the current year of 2.19%, which um, there's a decrease. If we flip the page 101, you'll see the change in the principal and the interest. The principal for the general fund debt went up from 265 to 270, but the interest went down. Again, similar to your mortgage, and the payments drop in. So that's the debt service piece. And then the last section, which is probably the, the biggest change, and again, as the mayor said, driven by building permits, which allowed us to do this. So normally we will have, we flip to page. 105, kind okay, of has the breakdown of this to look at. We've historically carried a contingency of 115,000. This is for the unforeseen that happen during the year that our budget anywhere, the, the emergency stuff that pops up that we, we need to have um, get fixed or, or um, handle. So that's what the uh, 115,000 is. You'll see below that is undesignated capital projects of a million dollars. We did this back in 2020 when we had this, when the EV building and the permit fees first increased and we needed kind of that fall back in case for some reason that we didn't hit that mark and we've put the undesignated capital and we froze those monies until we made sure we had the revenue before we went ahead and spent. With la the projections for 2021, they are significantly ab above what was budgeted and projected. Therefore, it allowed us to put a million dollars again into undesignated capital projects, which will allow us to do capital project work um, around the city. But that's not set for any one project at this point. Also, with the increase in um, the EV fees, which not you won't see it here, but on the revenue side, we are using um, 2.6 of fund balance in order to to help with that because we've collected those additional permit fees that were unbudgeted, which allowed us to utilize some of that fund balance. So that's where we're getting that 2.6 from. So that's the non-departmentals as no view and the use of the fund balance. Piece of this, so if you have any questions. All right. Questions from the council for the finance director? Anyway, uh, Councilor McCabe. I just want to make sure I understand. So the increase for the undesignated capital projects of a million dollars is actually being funded out of the revenue received from the permits? That, that's the main driver, but it's just where the, the general fund position was at the end of the year based on our over budget, over collected revenues versus budget, and then our under projected expenditures to budget. So it just allowed us some leeway to put, build that in. And we've been trying to do that in order to get some of these capital projects that or whether it's a beach project, a park project, a municipal building project, there's no 
it's not set for anything particular. When we go ahead and do it, it will come back to council for approval. Okay. But it's just to try to put, we were in a position where we could put some money away for future projects and kind of plan a little bit for the future and then not, not have a tax impact. So that. any department could say they have a capital project and they could try to utilize it, some of these funds? It would, it would go through, through the measures. Go through the process. Yeah, and then go, and then it would obviously come back to council for approval. But okay. it could be something that somebody, again, didn't have in their capital plan. <clears throat> and now, they, all right, we really need to do this. And it would make, would make the most sense in the use of the money. Okay, thank you. And according to the charter, any expenditures greater than ten thousand dollars, I'm required to bring before the council. So uh, the council will get an opportunity to vet the project, and then it'll be presented to the council, and then we'll go through the uh, our full deliberation process. And one thing that we did use that back in 2020 was when the fire truck had needed the frame repair mm -hmm. done. It just so happened that was the same year that we did that those funds for the fixing of the fire truck to extend the useful life. Okay. Any other questions for the finance director? Councilor Norris. Um, I'm asking because I don't know. Yeah. Is there a policy um, or range that you like to see the city debt service fall in year after year? There, there's limits that are set by state statute. We don't have an internal policy per se, so we just follow state statute with, with the limitations that they provide as a percentage of a multiplier for based on taxes. And that applies to the general fund and also the sewer. It does not apply to electric and water. Anything else for the finance director? Okay, thank you, Ron, that's it. All right, we'll move on to Parks and Rec. Uh, Mary, if you could come forward. The first one is the memorial bench for Richard Weiss. Get myself together. <laughs> All right, so yes, the first one is um, we have a, uh, another request for a memorial bench at the beach um, for Richard Weiss. Um, it was sent in by his family. Um, Lived 40, 49 years on Country, Cl Country Club Road. Um, it went to the beach almost every day, weather permitting. Um, so there's been a request for that. Questions from the council? Mm -hmm. Councilor Carter? Mm -hmm. Well, we've done a map. We've mapped out where we have existing memorial benches, where we've looked where we can put ad additional ones. Once we get this one approved, I believe I have room for three more at the beach. We also have Bristol Point, and we also have the park. I mean, nobody, you know, the park is an idea, uh, uh, an area people can put a bench to, but um, I don't know if anybody's been to the beach in the last month and a half or so. We've kind of put some to the north side of the Zabersky House on the grass. Uh, overlooking the water. Overlooking the water, but it gives us another area of flat land to kind of put some benches there. Um, people have been using them, um, but that's kind of our goal. If we, we have two there, if we can put another two there, we'll, once we get all that in place, we'll have 45 memorial benches down at the beach. And we're working on getting, the other part of the beach memorial was the walkway around the flagpole, and we are getting some pricing on how to, what, to put that in place. So that way this, the walkway's there with the stones, and eventually we can just pull a stone, engrave it, put it back down. Uh, somebody over here had a comment. Was that you, Councilor North? Oh, okay. Do you have a question? Yeah, the question was like, how much? How much does a family does a family give a donation or pay for the? So yes, the family is charged for the um, for the memorial bench. Um, it varies in price because they can get a refurbished bench, which is will take a existing bench and maybe we'll paint it back, paint it up, and get. Uh, and then we work with them for a plaque to put on it. Um, and then, or they could do a brand new, which we make from scratch with the parks crew. Um, we have all the materials to make those. And then, so it's up to the family what they want. Um, and then the plaque varies depending on how many letters and words are on it. And, you know, it's limited. It's a three by eight plaque that goes on the back side of the, uh, the back side of the chair, <laughs> the bench. <laughs> so, so yes, they, we, so once it's done and it's in place, we, we, we do invoice them. 
Any other questions? Okay, in that case, I need a motion, <clears throat> excuse me, a motion to move this to the mayor and council meeting of May 17th, 2021. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. Okay. Uh, sandbox donation? So, uh, yes, it's missing a word. It's, this is from the Sandbox Foundation. Oh, no, you're right. Um, the, the Sandbox Foundation is located, on, there's an indoor beach volleyball establishment that is out on 184 in the Mystic Groton area. They approached us about um, doing an upgrade to the existing volleyball court that's at Washington Park. Um, and so they would like to come in and, and do the work. Uh, they would uh, put in all the, the proper kind of sand, uh, a new net, the antennas, the border, the boundary lines, any miscellaneous hard, hardware, and uh, about 32 hours worth of labor, which equates to a $5,646 donation to the city to get that volleyball court, which is heavily used um, in the uh, spring, summer, and fall. So um, it's a nice way to get that um, upgraded, and they'll also work with my staff to how to maintain it so it, it stays in the condition that we receive it in. Questions or comments? Deputy Mayor Depot. I just want to say that I think that's really cool. I know a lot of people play um, at the beach volleyball courts all over. There's one in the city, there's one in the town. And, um, so this is a really nice gesture that they're doing. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's great. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, I need a motion to move this to the mayor and council meeting on May 17, 2021. So moved. Second. Motion is second. Further, any other, any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed. Abstention. Motion carries. Honkers. So, as you all are aware, we um, we contract with a goose control company. We've done it since long before I was here um, to keep the geese population um, under control at our facilities, especially Eastern Point Beach, so that um, it's we help helps keep the facility cleaned. Um, we do a yearly contract with the existing company that we've worked with. We did look at this last year to see if we have anybody else in the area, and the closest one is Greenwich. Um, they do have a satellite program in Brantford, but uh, Sue is, uh, and, and Ruger are ready to come back this summer, so I got their contract that needs to be approved so we can move forward for the 2021 20, season. Councilor McKay. Uh, how often do they come per every, week? She's here every day. Oh, every day. And sometimes twice a day at all. It's, they, so, There'll be times, Sue's been doing this for a number of years, so she knows the rotation of the three flocks of geese that we have that come to the beach, because there are three flocks. Um, and she's, she's got them on, she knows their rotation, she knows the migration, she knows this, she knows that. Um, so which is an asset to us having her with us. Um, she may be off some days by a half hour or so, like if I come in on Saturday, uh, 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 Saturday morning at 7.30 and I see them, it's a quick text and she's there within 15 minutes to spook them off, I guess. I don't know what she does, but it, she's and, there, there, and it's year-round. Yeah, and she does this with a dog? Yes, a border collie. Okay, Ruger. so <laughs> so um, I'm just curious, because, you know, the, the no dogs policy at Eastern Point Beach, especially during the season, does she get a lot of she, comments? She, or? Um, she had, uh, we did get her a badge, so she's identified as okay. an employee, contractual employee, and I got a little bit of pushback from IT, because the Ruger's in the badge picture with her, because they're, we're actually paying for Ruger. Right, <laughs> Sue, right. Sue's the handler. But uh, so we, so when she got that and was able to identify herself, um, and then it is also in the ordinance that that's one of the animal the dogs that are allowed on the property year round. So, yeah. Well, and to answer your question directly, <clears throat> answer is yes. I was down there walking and I saw a woman with a dog that was loose and it was running. And I went up to her and said, Excuse me, <laughs> uh, I'm the mayor, you may not know. And the dog was circling me the whole time, right? <laughs> and she said, well, you may not know, I'm the, I'm, you know, I'm with Honkers, the Goose Patrol. I said, I don't see a badge, you know? And she said, well, I don't have one. And so we got a badge as a result of that. Gotcha. But uh, what was really funny is that the dog was, was doing, Ruger was doing what he's supposed to do. And he was <laughs> circling me and, and those kind of things. But this is also part of the Baker Cove uh, watershed protection thing to try to keep the fecal core form levels down because of the, the geese feces and, and things like that. One of the things that we're trying to do is to reduce the fecal core form in the water so that eventually we'll be able to do uh, recreational shellfishing 
in Baker Cove. That's what we're shooting. That's the long-term goal for shooting for that. So this is one of the activities <clears throat> that the city does uh, as part of that. Councilor Carter, you had a comment? Yeah, I was just thinking about, or I know she does, she does for a while, this has come up for the first time. We can. Um, she doesn't just do the beach. She does Grizzle Point and she does Washington Park. So we could, I could reach out to her, moving, you know, with this contract and ask if we could add the. Um, it is. Oh, you're looking to expand to things you. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? There, yeah. There's. Okay. There's a hand, there's a flock that comes in there. Yes. All right. Then we can take and a look at that. We can talk to her about that. Yeah. Well, and that's down there near where you walk, and also you would see that more. What have you caught near uh, Puffins? Nope. Right, that belongs to the foundation. I have seen a lot of flocks now, of large flock down there. You're right. Okay. All right. Anything else on this? I don't need a motion to move this to the mayor and council meeting of May 17, 2021. So moved. Second. We have a motion to second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Third thing we're going to go to is department presentations, visioning Thames Street, Sierra. This is just information only, right? Is there, a, is this information, informing only, or is there, do I need, am I going to need to move this? Yeah. Okay, then please continue. presentation just to kind of give us a visual. Um, Joe provided you guys with a packet of the project proposal for Visioning Thames Street. Also um, a letter from our grant from Preservation CT um, for the grant for the vibrant communities and then also the, um, con the project agreement with Minigrate Hartman's. So, Um, just to give a, a little bit of a brief overview of some of the ongoing projects that we are doing, um, there is a JLA City of Groton Park Parking Management Study that is an assessment of parking projections and mitigation measures to accommodate expected growth at Electric Bowl and on local economic expansion. It will recommend. It will recommend policies and um, management solutions. Also, we are looking at pedestrian and bicycle network assessment. Um, we are assessing the transportation needs using a, very, a variety of community engagement tools. Um, you can join us May 19th. Let me just double check that date. Yes, May 19th at 4 o'clock, we will be meeting. I'm sorry, I don't know where the camera is. Um, <laughs> we will be meeting at the City Hall to do our first street audit. Um, it will be of Route 1, so um, feel free to come out for that. Uh, strategic communications. We are promoting communication channels to stimulate conversations between residents, businesses, and the city of Groton. Um, this evening, you guys will have received the first um, digital newsletter that has come out from the city, um, highlighting a lot of the key information, events, and um, stuff from the city of Groton. And then tonight, I'm going to talk to you guys about Visioning Thames um, Street, which is an engaged um, Planning Economic Development seeks to engage the community stakeholders in a series of exercises over the summer um, to really to help envision streetscape designs and um, some outdoor programming activity in, along Thames Street. If we go to the next slide, I kind of just explain this. Um, we, we will collaborate with the stakeholders and visioning exercises, um, identifying and implementing temporary installments um, along Thames Street to really bring our waterfront to life and get more people um, people and activities down there and, and really help to try to um, program some of the underutilized space that's there. You can go to the next slide. 
So the city of Groton um, applied for Preservation CT's Vibrant Communities Grants, and we were awarded $25,000 um, for it. It is going to be matched with $5,000 from Economic Development's current fiscal year budget. And so the grant award is um, paying for consultant services to help us with placemaking designs and um, doing the programming and, and working with um, the stakeholders to create a community-based action plan and also a budget of how we can really get these phase temporary improvements to, to get to these long-term um, visionings that we're trying to do. The next slide is, this is a project helix. So we're trying to figure out um, the best way to visualize all the work that has been done to lead up to this point. So back in 2019, um, Ninigret Partners um, did visioning, I'm sorry, did Thames River reconnect. It resulted for the city of Groton and the Thames Street Promenade Report. And um, a few individuals remember that we hosted an open house where the community was welcome to come in. They engaged with staff and the consultant to talk about different things that were happening um, on Bridge Street and Thames Street and ways that we could um, make improvements going forward. So um, that kind of started out with our engagement. But this all bridges from our 2019 plan of conservation and development from that 2019 Thames Street Promenade report. And we also are pulling from the town of Grottens, which we are part of a um, collaborative effort on for their economic development strategy. So the visioning Thames Street tries to align all of our visioning stuff into from a plan to engagement and then execution. So the gray lines are the um, pink, plan, blue execution or implementation, and the gray is the engagement. Um, some of the engagement that we have done from the open house to kind of really bridge it right now has been our survey. So for Groton Riverwalk was our first survey that we conducted for Thame Street. We've gotten nearly 200 responses um, on that survey. And there is a second survey out um, now through the link of that um, newsletter and it will also be put online to kind of dig in a little bit deeper about specific improvements that we would like to do or things that the community would like to um, see. So I ask and invite everyone to participate in that survey. And then the visioning exercises, um, we anticipate it will be a combination between virtual and some outdoor on-site engagements um, to really try to get the wheels turning and get some plans um, implemented and discussions had. Do you guys have any questions on I know this helix might be a little <laughs> much. I, I did. I have a question. Um, I did attend uh, the 2019 uh, in-house, open, open house. Yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, that was really interesting. I really, uh, I, I got a lot out of that. But I was just wondering if any of the feedback uh, turned into a, an implementation plan. Did, did Were we able to, to take any nugget that we gain from talking mm -hmm. with people and turn that into some action or do we have a, a specific action plan it is turned into action where it's helped us start to plan the programming so it, it helped us create visioning things so and knowing there's more of a discussion that needs to be had mm -hmm. and there's more specifics like because our PLCD and integrate partners was very high level and broad so mm -hmm. for us, for planning economic development, we really want to start to get into the weeds of how do we do community-based action plans and how do we start to phase these plans out so that they're incremental in designs that we can test as a community, but at the same time try to figure out, okay, what do we really need to plan for long-term planning at the same time? Am I explaining that well enough? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, oh, cool. sometimes no. I, I could go. Um, okay. So, <clears throat> Deputy Mayor Depot. Um, I just wanted to say, I think, you know, uh, like this stuff is, is very interesting to <clears throat> someone like us. We're all kind of intimately involved. And I think, you know, we've gotten feedback of like, why do we do projects like this? And m my thing is, um, you know, the, when the first survey came out, I was pushing people to, f to complete the survey. 200 people sounds like a, a good number, but it would be nice if we could get even more feedback from the community. So I would just encourage as many people as possible to fill out, and I'll go online and share, share the heck out of the link, which is what I always do, because part of the, 
the effort that we've been trying, and I think on this council the last several years been trying to make sure that whatever plans we put in place is what the people actually want. And the problem is, well, not the problem, but what we've been trying to push for is more engagement so that we make sure that we don't go on the opinion of 10 residents and then the other, you know, 500 in that area hate the project. So I think, you know, Thame Street has been a long time coming. And, you know, if you have a question about any of these things, please send them our way because, you know, Sierra is giving us obviously a, a detailed presentation, but she's she can explain things if people have questions. Um, I just want to make sure that we people know to engage if they have a question, if this if they want to see this presentation or more details. Um, but the to me, the core of all of these things is to make sure that when we do implement things, that they're the right things. Right. So I just want like I appreciate all the the <clears throat> effort, and I I want to encourage people. Please, please, please fill out the surveys that we send out because it makes a big difference in what, where we go. <laughs> into what, um, what you were just talking about of, of ways to engage with us. So um, yes, um, council and public, please feel free to contact me. Um, I guess for the record, you can reach me at 860-446-4066. And also my email is patrickc at cityofgotten.gov. Um, um, the EDC also has four working groups that people are willing to um, we're more than welcome to volunteer on. It's coastal vulnerability, um, pedestrian and bicycle network assessment, Dane Street planning, and then economic development programming. Um, upcoming workshops we have, like I said, on May 19th at 4 um, p.m. We'll be meeting here at the City Hall to do our first street audit of Route 1 for um, our priority areas map. You can learn more about what the map is and everything on the City of Groton website. Um, but it really is around Washington Park and kind of loops back down around the municipal building is the area that we're going to be focusing on primarily for the first um, street audit. And then um, just to reiterate the surveys, um, the Groton River Walk survey is still out there and will remain up there until the end of the week. And then there's also now a public participation and a walkable thing street on the survey that is out there. <coughs> Councilor McCain. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say I know I'll be here on May 19th uh, at 4 p.m. here at the Municipal Building to do that um, street survey. Uh, so anybody interested in coming, bring your sneakers because we are walking. Anyone else from the council? Councilor Norris. Thank you very much. Ni nice presentation and uh, I like this packet. Got a quick question and <coughs> actually following, following up on the Deputy Mayor's statement in question. So uh, on the attachment is talking about scope of work mm -hmm. and uh, it, it says here the consulting team anticipates to anticipates up to 15 interviews slash con conversations with businesses and other key stakeholders. Is that 15 individuals? Is that 15 group meetings? So we plan on having three workshops and then there would be 15 additional meetings one-on-one -on -one with certain property owners or businesses um, along Thames Street for a deeper dive into that discussion. Okay, and who determines who those 15 interviews are? Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Anyone else? So, <clears throat> you know, there's been, uh, as a result of the election, there's been a renewed interest in Thame Street, and a lot of people are concerned about what are you doing? It's, you know, it's been this way for a long time. What people don't know is behind the scenes, we've been working on things, and this is part of it. We are, we're ready now to, to we've, we've engaged the community once before. We're gonna start re-engaging the community. There is going, we will at some point in the very near future establish uh, basically a community team that will help us to get information out to residents on Thames Street and a conduit to get information from the residents to staff and to help us with promotion of ideas and what we can do to help revitalize Thames Street. Because there's a lot of things that we are working on now, as you can see these projects. Uh, some 
We have consultants that are helping us, some we're working on on our own, and some we're gonna be working together with the community, with, uh, with the community and business owners and other stakeholders in the community to revitalize Thames Street. So it is an ongoing project. It is something that is gonna take us some time to do. But again, one of the things that helps is I think I mentioned this before, we got the $649,000 grant from the SHIP Small Harbor Improvement Projects Program. Uh, and that's gonna help revitalize, or we will redo the piers down on, uh, the docks rather, down on uh, Thamesview Park, and that will help. So all these things that we're doing are little things that are gonna build together to make the big thing, which is a revitalization of the city of Groton, and in this particular case, in Thame Street. So any, anything else for Sierra? Okay, I need, I need a motion to move this to the mayor and council meeting of 17 May 2021. So moved. Second. Okay. We have a motion to second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. Motion carries. You were, you were done, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't cut you off. Okay. No, All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sierra. You're okay. The next thing we're going to look at is 742 Grot Utilities. Director Gaday. So, Council, what you received in your budget packets is you have the electric, water, and sewer budgets. We are not going to discuss them today. They were delivered to you so that you will have time to review them and then come up with any questions that you may have. We will be reviewing the electric, water, and sewer budgets at the next Committee of the Whole, which will be May 24th. Okay, so I just wanted to let you know about that. The first thing we'll talk about is the Earthlight Washington Park. <clears throat> Ron? Um, we, GU is requesting permission to move ahead and use Reggie funds to fund uh, an Earthlight um, purchase order to upgrade the lights in Washington Park all to LED with a brand new control system. Uh, and this was originally requested by Mary to improve the park. When we looked at the lights, the lights are eons old, or like 30 years or older, and they actually require quite a bit of maintenance. So uh, this will replace the lights, improve the quality of the lighting. Plus it is not funded by the ratepayers or, or the city, it is funded using um, Reggie funds, which are uh, greenhouse gas monies that utilities are receiving for uh, doing energy efficient upgrades. So that, that money, those monies are used for doing more energy efficient upgrades. Councilor McCain. So are you just replacing the existing lights as they, as they stand or uh, are you looking at the different sort of, you know, placing them in different places that might be better or it'll be using the existing light towers okay with different configurations on the top okay as as recommended by the contractor so you're replacing not just the bulbs but the actual hardware as well right yes America? does that answer your yeah question, but it's you utilizing the existing poles is right. what Correct. you're saying okay changing poles is a is a, a bigger big deal. deal it's yeah. a real big deal you end up involving code officials and everything okay right Deputy Mayor Depot. Um, is this, does this replace all of the lights at the park? Yes. And it improves the lighting on the courts. So it's, it's expanding it. Deputy Mayor Depot. Sorry, I just wanted to add, um, I know that I um, have recently talked with a lot of people whose kids play baseball on those fields, and I know that they will really appreciate the lights improvement. So I think it's great great project yeah and, and I'm gonna give this one to the mayor it was a pretty good suggestion because it was originally in Mary's capital budget so we were able to remove it from the capital budget and fund it in this manner very good 
Okay. Uh, Councillor Sheffield. Ron, will that include coverage on both basketball courts? I do believe. Yes. I do believe. I know one court will be darker than the other, so as Yeah, well, currently the lights don't actually aim over there. Oh, exactly. So, so there's another set of lights going in for the other side. Okay, that's very good. So we are looking to do that to help those courts as well. Any, Deputy Mayor Depot. I'm sorry. Um, it's okay. When do we expect this to be done? Um, when we cut the purchase order now, it'll take us another month because uh, the meeting isn't actually for quite a while. Um, then they have to order the equipment. It could take up to three months to get all the equipment, but it'll certainly be done before winter. Okay. The idea was is to do it during this uh, warm season. And <clears throat> it was originally going to be in the 22 budget anyway, which wouldn't start until 1 July. So it will be pushed out a little bit. Any other questions on the, the lights? Councilor Sheffield. I didn't. Who's? Chris Piazza. Chris Piazza. Uh, what's it? Yeah, Chris. Could you email the questions to us? Sure. What do I email at Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chris. I didn't recognize that Chris was there. Anything else on uh, Councilor Sheffield? What was the cost uh, again for the for this project? Earth like 254000 That's including the contingency. <clears throat> so Mary had put in for capital for 80. Now it's 240. You're like, okay, where's that coming from? This was going to be a phased approach to build up the capital so that we had it. But now that we're able to use Reggie funds, we're going to get the project completed in one fell swoop. Does that make sense to everybody? No, yeah. Okay. Because if we if we have the money and we have a way to pay for it, uh, then we're going to continue to do that as long as we can. All right. Any other questions on this? Hearing none, uh, I need a motion to move this to May 7th to the Mayor Council meeting of May 17, 2021. So moved. Second. A motion to second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. Okay, first choice, safety solutions. Ron? Um, every year we've been coming to council to cut a, another purchase order for an extension on our safety consultant contract. Um, uh, the current year is the end year last of a five-year contract that we enter to, into. So uh, the GU safety team went out for another five-year contract and we had, um, we've interviewed five companies um, and uh, came up with a recommendation with first choice safety solutions. Um, it's about $138,000 a year. It's a five year contract, but it has a two year, a 2% 2 escalation in it. Um, in the process, in each year, we've talked about in here the possibility of hiring an internal person to do this work. Um, so we said that we would do a business case analysis on that. Um, as the last safety consultant was leaving, um, he was willing to share the amount of money he made. He made $99,000 a year. Um, he had finance do an analysis and it was figured out that it would cost us uh, $160,000 a year uh, to hire this person as an employee internal. Um, Additionally, so taking that into consideration, the safety team also looked at this, um, and they prefer not having an internal employee for several several reasons. Uh, one of them being that uh, the person develops a bias uh, based on their reporting hierarchy and the relationships that, that they've developed within the company. 
Um, and it was very interesting because in the utility commission meeting, that uh, was actually backed up by um, Commissioner Scully, who says that in the past they did hire this position internally, and it became it was actually uh, not a good idea. Uh, when I asked the companies why we would outsource this rather than insource it, each contractor, when they came in and we interviewed them, I asked them this question. And they said, well, the, one of the largest reasons is that if there's not a personality fit, you're able to turn over and request another person. Uh, First Choice Safety has uh, 92 employees. They're a company that was formed seven years ago. And in that time, they now have 92 employees, so they're doing a really good job. They're based in this, out of Mystic. They're mostly local people. And the two people that formed the company actually worked here. It was one of their last uh, contracted positions before they went to form this company. Uh, they're very utility-based. Uh, they concentrate on uh, an industrial environment, environment. And this contract does also cover uh, parks and recs in the back um, with public, uh, public works. Um, I think that's the meat of what we're recommending. Again, it would be uh, uh, to approve the five-year contract with an annual spend starting at 138000 Any questions for Director Gaudet? So one of the things that that Ron and I have talked about in the past is the internal funding of this versus external funding of this. And one of the challenges you run into is, one, you're hiring a full-time employee with benefits all the way out, and then the cost of that. The other thing that helps us if we go with a company is that they have reach back. And what I mean by that is if we're, let's say for example, we're gonna work on uh, a permitted combined space, confined space entry, and there's very specific requirements for that. And if, if, if that individual is not comfortable with that, then they can reach back and find one of their safety experts that is comfortable with that. Or let's say for example, last year, there was a change in the silica requirements from the OSHA, OSHA and so Jim Healy was able to reach back to someone who was a silica expert and come in and train us on the new requirements for the OSHA, OSHA requirements regarding masking, filtration, uh, wetting of silica components, what it meant, what it applied to, what it doesn't apply to, and those kinds of things. So there was an advantage there. So any other comments? Deputy Mayor Depot. Um, <clears throat> what was the amount we paid for the last year? Uh, this for this year? Or, yes. Yeah, for this year, this is uh, about $5,000 less a year than we're currently paying. We're, we're about 145. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, I need a motion to move this to the Mayor and Council meeting on May 17, 2021. So moved. Second. We have a motion to second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Extension motion carries. Environmental Partners? Uh, environmental Partners, we currently are working with Environmental Partners to help us approve the PCB re remediation plan. Um, we're now entering the part where we have to do phase two. So the GU budgets that you have in front of you for next year currently have a half a million dollars in them for phase two PCB remediation for the water filtration plant. So originally we had estimated that uh, finishing removing the PCBs from the water filtration plant would cost $1.5 million. At this point where the project will leave off, we're estimating will cost $500,000. This contract or this purchase order and work that we're giving environmental partners is to work with the EPA to approve that phase two remediation so that we will finish and have no more PCBs at the water filtration plant. Um, so the $200,000, $205,000 has a 10% contingency in it is 
included in that $500,000 estimate. So there's about $300,000 more actual physical work. A lot of the heavy work is actually getting the approval from the EPA and the testing. This actually includes the testing that goes along with that. Um, I'll, with that, I'll go to questions. Questions regarding this? Deputy Mayor Depot. So this is still a result of the, when we did the project at the water filtration plant of the PCBs that were not planned for, correct? So, so any major work in uh, large facilities requires us to remove the PCBs. This is the work that the water project did not touch. So it, it's anything that the project work touched We've seen um, change orders to the project come through here to pay for that PCB remediation. When the project leaves, there's certain areas in the building that the project didn't go into, whether it's a certain rooms or a hallway or a stairway that the project actually didn't um, change anything. So that work was left over for us to take care of. We had originally done a plan that was a 15 year plan because we thought it was going to take us, uh, it was going to cost a lot of money and take many years to do it. The EPA came back to me after they, while they were approving that first plan and said, we, we would like you to agree to get, um, finish the PCB job as soon as possible after the project is finished because you know there's PCBs in the building. We said, um, well, we really not want to spend that money until we have to. She, she made us agree to do it within three years. So at that point, we estimated that the job was going to be uh, $1.5 million. And I said, well, we might be able to afford a half a million dollars a year. At this point, it looks like a half a million dollars will finish the project. So at that, that means one more year, the first budget year, which is the budget year you have, we're given today, FY22. <clears throat> So <clears throat> did we find these PCBs while we were doing the other project or we knew they were there before? Yes to both. We knew they were there before, but the problem became well defined while the project was in motion. We've always known that the, pa uh, the paint in the uh, filtration plant contained PCBs. Okay. So in the, in the old plant, we knew we had PCBs in the paint. Then when the new plant was built, there were not gonna be any PCBs with the new plant, but where the new plant tied into the old plant is where we run into the PCB problems. And then the PCB problems had not been, uh, my words, fully scoped and identified, and therefore that's where the expansion of the money came in to having to go spend that. In the, in the process, we identified that so we knew we had PCBs in the old plant. So what we did is we decided to take advantage of this and determine the full extent of the PCBs in the old plant. We thought we were gonna be able to have a long-term plan and the EPA said, no, you need to have a shorter term than a longer term. So the plan that Ron wants to execute will basically get rid of, and one of the things we wanna do, there's, there are some areas that are inaccessible we wanted to get permission to close the door, lock the door, weld the door, you know, so that there's no access, but the EPA was not amenable to that. So we're going to have to uh, abate the PCBs there such that in the future when we do demolition, a PCB is not an issue. And so that's what this will do is this will abate, abate all the PCBs in the water plant, in the old water plant. Councilor McCabe. Just just to clarify, what I think I heard you say is that you initially thought it was 1.5 million to do this final abatement of the PCBs, but it turns out it's only going to be half a million. Therefore, uh, we, we should just go get it done kind of right. in one year. It, because as in my conversations with the EPA, I said we should, if we have to move forward, the most I can, we can afford to do is about a half a million dollars a year. So when it turned out it was a half a million, there really doesn't make sense to say, well, we're going to wait and do it on the third year. Right, right, right. So we're gonna... it means we got to take the hit. Okay. Um, also, um, 
by starting this now, this money is in, is going to be proposed in next year's budget, but we're proposing to kick the purchase order off now so that it's under starting to kick off and being underway because the current contractor that RH White is using to do the P PCB remediation, the hope is, is that they will put in on this job and be able to do it cheaper because they're so familiar with the building right now and the techniques that we're using in this building with environmental partners um, methods that, that there'll be kind of be a synergy. That's why we're moving this ahead before the budget actually goes all the way through. But most of the spend will be in the next budget year anyway. In the way the utility budget works, um, the, when we spend it is the budget year that it ends up in. So kicking it off now, it's pretty much all in the next year's budget anyway. Good. Deputy Mayor Depot. Um, <clears throat> since this is, it's not an approved budget expense, it's coming out of the earned um, funds, right, the earn, uh, retained earnings. Is this going to have any impact on water rates? Um, no, because we're, it, it, it's fitting within the rate track that uh, was just rolled out in the prior year with that cost of service study, which was three years of 4%. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Is there anything else on this slide item? Okay. Need a motion to move this to mayor and council meeting on May 17, 2021. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. Motion carries. Blue Rock transmission line land clearing. Um, I believe the, the council is aware of the $15 million transmission upgrade project, which is basically um, an investment in the transmission system that we own coming into Boddington. Um, those assets, when they're upgraded, we get a return uh, on investment from the ISO on the order of magnitude of 8 to 10%. So we will be making money back on the improved assets that we're being required to do by the ISO. Uh, Blue Rock is more of a civil engineering or civil company. They need to come in and um, improve the roads to allow access to the transmission towers so that a company can, can, another company can come in and install the new transmission towers. So this 2.3 million, to actually 2.4 million dollars is to install all the access to the, uh, that area. Um, there's a lot of ledge, there's a lot of almost cliffs, um, and it's a very challenging terrain back there. So this is the first large purchase order for that project. And it's going to be a couple of smaller purchase orders for this total amount to this company. Question on this, Councillor Sheffield. Um, how long will the project, uh, you know, start to finish? Um, once this purchase order is um, issued, this part of the project is anticipated to take about three months, and then we'll be moving right into towers, uh, installing the towers. I expect you to see uh, the us to be coming to you for requesting those purchase orders probably in two to three months. It's, it's going to start happening fast once the designs come through. Did you? Okay, any other questions on this? Hey, I need a motion to move this to the mayor and council meeting on May 17, 2021. So, so move. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Extension motion carries. BHI Energy for the South Yard Assembly Building. Uh, BHI is a preferred vendor, and I believe in your package you, you may have a map. Um, it was in there. Yeah, yes, the map. The map actually shows where the new EV receiving station is going to be for the new 34,500 volt lines that are coming in. So um, this purchase order is to BHI to install the Hendrix new Hendrix, it's basic spacer cable that'll be right at the top of those poles coming in from Chester down Eastern Point Road to the new uh, receiving station and then coming down Nicholas Ave and up Eastern Point Road a little bit to the receiving station. It's for um, 
about a quarter million dollars, including uh, contingency. Um, uh, and that's for a contractor to help us out and get that work done. It's all, that entire portion of this project is a customer paid upgrade. So EB is uh, paying for this. And if you go down Nicholas Ave, you can see the new poles that have been set. Uh, and some of the cross arms are starting to go up on those. Right. So the, the guys are actually putting in, uh, working and putting in the poles and the cross arms, and we'll do the swap over for all the lower stuff. Right. Okay, we need a motion to move this to the Mayor and Council meeting on May 17, 2021. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention. Motion carries. Electric reliability certificate. Um, I actually don't have a copy of it in my package, but we did get um, a reliability uh, certificate for, um, we actually work with APPA and every month we submit all of our, our statistics. Um, yeah, it, and uh, because we're in the very top percentage of all the public power for reliability, we were given a certificate um, and we just thought we'd share that. So that's informing only. Councilor McCabe. I was going to say, as a customer, I appreciate your reliability. <laughs> yes, I will definitely communicate that to the guys. They appreciate the compliments. Well, if you, if you look, I'm sorry, Debbie Mayor I, I was just going to say, uh, it is one of the things that I get feedback about, people are happiest about, is having Groton Utilities. Um, it is a big perk of living in this area. And uh, I don't think anyone questions the reliability. We're always getting power back for surrounding Everybody. towns. <laughs> so, right. so thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, I was asked a question today about Eversource and about ground utilities. And uh, our reliability is there, as demonstrated by this. Our costs are 20% uh, less. Our, you know, the things that we're doing with the tree cutting and with the uh, the wires that we're doing and the cutouts and all the maintenance that we do to maintain our system is one of the reasons that we're able to restore power as quickly as we can. And that is a, a tremendous shout out to the men and women that are working for Groton Utilities and in the electric section specifically. So that's good news. All right. I think that's all for here because that's just reporting. So that's good. Let's go to the next thing, which is Groton Utilities Financials. First one on page six is the electric division. Total electric revenue on row 19 is 37.5 million versus the budget of 37 million or 535,000 favorable. Um, as you can see, the trend is the same as it's been throughout the year, um, continuing on where the residential and industrial are um, the above budget where the commercial is below from the revenue standpoint. Total operating expenses on row 41 is just under 40 million and the budget's right at 40 million so it's 103,000 or 4,000 below budget so when you look at the total it is um, pretty much on course with budget you'll see in the expense there is some discrepancies purchase power is up and um, oper operation and maintenance is below budget but from, <coughs> from the total operating it is um, pretty much level or just slightly below Net income from operations, row 52, is 4.1 million versus a budget of 2.3 or 1.8 million favorable above budget at the end of March 2021. And that's the year to date summary for electric. So again, when you look at um, the net, operation, net income from operations, row 52, we are approximately 1.8 um, favorable to the budget. Councilor McCabe. Can you just remind me? Um, why the commercial is actually lower in the revenue than the budget 
the way that the budget is produced for revenue, it's historical. And um, we switched the methodology from just doing a previous one year to a three year trending. So the, the actual sales are down. I'm guessing a lot of it driven by COVID okay. and the commercial cast. And again, you'll see that the res residential is above and so is the industrial, but the commercial is the one that's really, and you'll see that even in the other divisions. Okay, thank you. Yes, I'm sorry. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Okay, thank you, Councilor Norris. So are these revenues um, or the increase in these revenues compared, is that pretty standard year to year? The increase in the revenues? Yes, the, or the variance. Um, in, in a perfect world, if we hit our average in the last three years with the rate increases, they would match the budget for this time frame. Um, again, it's hard to kind of predict the usage. And one of the pages in this report, which is page eight, you can actually see kilowatt hour sold um, by, by each one. So you can see that um, the fiscal year to date and the prior year for residential, we'll just use residential, it's seven million kilowatts more than what was, where again, in the commercial you'll see that it's down. Anything else on electric? Okay, water. If we flip to page 12. Row 17 to the total water revenue. Um, the actual is 8.8 .8 million versus a budget of 8.3 or just under 500,000 um, above budget. Again, the main driver here is the industrial and so a little bit from the residential and you can also see that the commercial is is down following the same trend as electric row 32 operating earnings um, currently actually row, row 30 the total operating expenses is 7.8 million for a budget of 8.3 or 482,000 um, below budget row 44 the net earnings before the dwsrf grant is 1.1 million versus a budget of negative 831,000, or just about $2 million favorable um, versus the budget. And one of the big driving factors in that um, DWRS grant that net earnings is due to the interconnect that has not been done yet between- The Pocotonic? Yeah, that one. So the Pocotonic uh, interconnect across uh, the bridge going to the Mohegan Sun. That's the interconnect that we're talking about there. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Councilor Norris. What is the DWSRF grant? It's a drinking water state revolving fund. That is, um, we received a loan um, from the state of $54 million to do the water treatment plant. And part of that we received a grant of 15 million and part of that grant agreement was that we need to do interconnects. There are certain interconnects that we had to do, which the last one being the one that we were just discussing. So that's, that's what that grant is. There's, there was the loan piece of it, which was the original piece, and then we subsequently got a grant that offset that loan. Yeah, the $15 million grant was, was based on five interconnects. So we had five interconnect agreements with various uh, communities surrounding us. And what the purpose of that is one, it's expansion for us, but two, it's resiliency and drought resilience. And because uh, we have fairly deep aquifers, plus if you look at our reservoir, we have just millions and millions of gallons of water. And some of the other uh, uh, localities have challenges with, with drought resistance. And then there's some locations that have uh, challenges with heavy minerals in their water. So th that's, uh, the DPH, Department of Public Health, wanted us to reach out for the interconnectivity for resiliency throughout the entire region. Anything else on water? Okay, sewer. And we'll flip to page 17. And again, the same trend that we saw 
in the other two divisions for sewer on row 15 the total sewer revenue is 3.6 million versus a budget of 3.2 or 348,000 favorable the big variance there is in the industrial um, as you may recall there was one of our large industrials had some issues with deduct meters which led to um, the increased revenue total operating expenses row 26 2.2 2 million versus a budget of 2.7 or 533,000 favorable. Row 37 net income from operations, 1.3 million versus a budget of 300,000 or just under a million dollars favorable to budget. Questions on sewer? Okay, and that's it for the financials. We will go now to 698, which is the CAFR overview. So this is just inf informational. Um, the CAFR has been posted. The June 30, 2020 CAFR has been posted. It's online. Um, hard copies will be circulating when we do receive them. But if the CAFR is posted. So we just wanted to make everybody aware. Make sure everybody's aware. Deputy Mayor Depot. Um, I was just going to say, I know that it's been some years we get it later than others, and it feels like it's coming earlier and earlier or getting completed. This one, this year was actually a little bit later than last year. We did run into mm -hmm. some, some COVID um, things with, with the change in the firm. There's actually the firm merged with another firm right towards the end of the year. So we're we're shooting to get better, but this one was a little bit, a little bit later. But yeah, there, it, it has been fluctuating around. Yeah. Because your your copy will come through. Yeah. Oh, the, yeah. Okay. Okay. Anything else on the CAFR? Okay, we'll move on. 748, donation request, Fish High School grad party. Do you wanna? So we have a request from the Fitch High school one is a, a golf tournament, which typically is, I'm sorry? Okay. I was about to say Grant Utilities typically funds that. So in the normal fashion, Grant Utilities is going to fund that. So I'd like to go buy that because one of the things that we're trying to do if Grant Utilities is funding stuff, not double dip. So the next thing is the Fitch High School grad party and they have uh, different donation requests here for uh, for donations. The oh, they're going to do all of it. They will do at least one. Okay, so that means we're not going to do it. We don't need to do it. Okay, then I take it back. This was informational. The Grand Utility is just going to do it. When I when this got put in here today. When we left, I we did not know the answer. Now we know the answer. Can and I just so add one one thing to that? Yes. Just so when the questions comes up, we've to date donated three thousand nine hundred dollars out of the five thousand dollar allotment, leaving eleven hundred dollars. Just so the group knows okay. where we're at with that. And we still have until the end of June, in the event that another in other requests come up. Okay, so. <clears throat> That's it with where we are, but I need a motion to suspend the rules to go into executive session pursuant to Connecticut General Statute 1 206 A to A to discuss personnel in the police department to include the council, Captain Jenkins, Sergeant Lito, Chief Spellman, and Linda Avedesian. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. We are in executive session. Oh, you're right. So you're right. I have I need a two thirds vote. So all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. We are now in executive session. Thank you. There will be no 
uh, action coming out of this uh, resolution.